Today is not a day about spoilers. Today is a day about the world of Carnival Row. We're going to start talking today about the fairish people. All of the information that I'm using is based off of stuff that I've either seen in the special features or that they printed in the RPG companion to the show. If you haven't seen Carnival Row, there really shouldn't be any spoilers, but this should help you understand a little bit better what's going on on today's Project Shadow. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, especially if you're reading my new book, Crucify My Love. Just a reminder, if you hear anything in the background, we got two new, new little kitties and they're not that far away from me because I've been keeping an eye on them because they're just babies. So, you might hear them in the background. Today, we're going to be talking about the fairish folk of Carnival Row. And some of the interesting things that they've done with them. But before we get started, if you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. It tells the algorithms to share the podcast with more people. The more people that listen, the bigger the community. The bigger the community, the better the chance we actually have of communicating with one another. And after all, that's why I do this show in the first place. Thank you to everybody who's already done that. And now on with the show. So, it, it's no secret that I really like Amazon Prime's Carnival Row. I think it's an interesting series. I think season one was fairly good. I've heard some people complain about it because there are people who like to complain. But, <laughs> it is a wonderful mishmash of all manner of different genres coming together and colliding in the sort of way that I actually like. I like my gaslamp f- fiction to have magic and mysteries and maybe even a couple mad gods looming in the background. But maybe that's just me. But since so many of you liked the episode that I did on Carnival Row, and I promised that I would do some more deep dive world building things, Let's talk about the world. So when we're talking about the fairish folk in Carnival Row, we're really talking about a couple different groups. We have the fairies, or as they are pejoratively called, the Picts. And they're slight, hollow-boned, they have wings, they are able to fly. So they're kind of obvious in some ways, and not in others. More obvious are all the ones that follow. There are fawns, which you will remember. They have kind of sheepish legs that are actually described in the RPG as similar to a horse, which actually I believe would make them a sylvan, not a fawn, but that's just if you're going off of Greek classifications. I believe it was a sylvan, I believe they were called sylvans, or at least Sylvanus was a fawn-like creature who had the body, the bottom half of a horse rather than a goat. But they do have the large horns, and they're rather well decorated. I re- really like the way that they looked. Then you have the Tro. We didn't meet a Tro character in course of the show, though we did see several of them in the background. They are rather large. They are um, ogre-ish, troll-ish. Like I said, there have been several seen in the background, but none of them have really been to the fore. The same with the centaurs. We've seen quite a few centaurs in the series, but not, not as many really brought forward. Now, the interesting thing about the centaurs is unlike the others that we're going to be talking about, they are actually 
native to Me- Mesogea or Mesogea. Never heard them actually pronounce that. It could be pronounced either way. Don't know how they're going to do it. I'm probably going to say Mesogea, which is the main continent. That's where Berg and the Pact are. And oh, trust me, we're going to be doing an episode on them now that I know more about them. But that's a future episode. So the centaurs are actually native to Mesogea, the continent that our humans are from. They are... I, I'm not going to say too much about them because I want to stay more with just the fairish folk. The last are the kobolds. If you are a fan of my work, if you've read my bo- books, you know I love kobolds. Kobolds show up in both Shine Like Thunder and in um, The Chain. They're a mythical species that I love. They are small. They are tidy, tiny. They are the uh, acting troupe, if you watch the show. I, I think they're adorable, and I hope they come out with toys of them, because I, I, I'll admit, I'll buy some. I will. I'll buy a plushie. I'll buy a vinyl. I, I, I will buy some. They're, they're just too cute. So, like I said, the humans and the centaurs are from Mesogea. All of the other species that we're going to be talking about are either from Tirnanak or from Ignota. And I'm sorry, the kitties have started making noises. Um, and each have their own cultures, customs, and histories. The problem being that, well, the pack have, and well, not just the pack, but the pack and the Berg invaded and have fought two major wars over their lands. Now, we've only heard about some of the lands of the Farish folk, but there are a lot, a lot more, that we have not talked about or met on the show yet. This is also going to be something that we talk about when we talk about the peoples of Mesogea, because the Pack and the Berg are not the only countries there. There are others. But in Turnanok, we... Let's see. Tur- Turnanok is surrounded by the Typhonic Ocean. on, And, well, it has many, many countries in here. In the middle, we will see both the... You, if you get to look at the map, you will find both the Turnanese Sea and the Ignotan Sea. Now, I'm not going to go through and name all of the empires and peoples and whatnot that appear on the map, but I will say many of the stories that we've heard from the characters that we've met so far, so far are from either the kingdom of Anun, which is on the north side of the island, or from Ignota itself, and from Puyan, which is just across the Ternanese Sea from Tirnanak. There are quite a few imp- countries listed on here. Now, one of the things I do wish that they had done, because then we could really talk about this a bit better, is how many of these are currently under the control of the pack. Now that the pack has been taken over, is it just up in the north? Or what, but we, we will have to see as they build the show up. There are also a whole bunch of islands around, but that's that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the people. Now, according to their own histories, everything begins long ago in the nameless aeons, drifting alone in the silent, shapeless murk before all things. The great dreamer Danu finally awoke to encounter another like herself. This is the beginning of the Song of Tirnanok. Now, <clears throat> this translation, which was written by Tourmaline Larue, who you may know from the show, goes on in detail to explain how Danu and Dahir created the world and how everything came to be. Now, there are many gods in the Pantheon, which we had already surmised because, well, they often use the phrase, the gods. 
makes it kind of obvious, yes? So, who are the gods of the fairish folk? Well, we have Danu, who is the mother creator goddess, Dahir, who is the all father, Morigu, who is the goddess of war, Lunessa, the queen of the underworld, Cleo, the goddess of love and sex, Brio, the god of poetry and song, Losk, the god of the forge, Masu, the god of the sea, Taran, the grim reaper, Ankau, the speaker, Be- Belisama, who is a local river goddess, and Niskai, who is also a local well goddess. Now, these are just some of the characters that some of the gods that we've heard in passing. We've heard some of them actually referenced on the show, and I expect we're going to hear a lot more in the season to come. So one of the things that we've heard most about is the odd relationship between the fairies and the um, fawns. They do seem to have a strained relationship, and it seems that originally they shared land together. The fawns once lived in Tirnanog, but they don't anymore. Because the first historical character that comes into sight when we're looking at, at fairish history is the Queen of Crows. She does not have a name. She's not remembered with a name merely the Queen of Crows. She claimed to be descendant of the gods, and the only real thing that we know about her is that she helped, well, she exiled the people, the the fawns, from Tirnanok. She's why the fawns are all in Ignota, because that was her great work, which to me says that we are probably going to see more strife between the fawns and the fairies in a way that we haven't so far in season one. Because, to be f- quite frank, we didn't see a lot of interreact in, 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 intermingling between fairies and fawns, and I thought that that was interesting, and we didn't see between any of the other fa- fairish folk in the series. But, now that I know a little bit more of their history, there seems to be more there than has been uncovered, and probably old resentments that may arise in Season 2, given how Season 1 ended. I'm trying not to do spoilers in this episode, because I really want people to watch the show. To me, one of the saddest things about the RPG is, while it tells us a lot about the fairies, and we're going to talk about them more in a minute, it actually doesn't have a section about the fawns. So hopefully we will get that information soon because they're they're just kind of a blank slate for for me right now. And I I, I want more. So the other great historical figure that we've actually heard referenced on the show on numerous occasions is Satan Titania, or as uh, Tourmaline refers to her quite often as Saint Tit. Saint Titania is a very interesting character. So according to the story, this would be in the third century of the old era on the Burgish calendar. The queens of the dominion of Anun were always queens. They, they, They were a matriarchal society. But when the queen died, when the dominion of Anun died, and she didn't have a female heir, her son was named king because they had to put somebody on the throne. He then started a war with, um, let's see, Tirnambeo, and it was a brief war, and it basically ended with him getting a new wife. The peace treaty was signed, and he was married um, to Hadion, and they had a daughter, Nimia. 
Now, once Nimia was born, they he took his wife and his child and exiled them to the Isle of Lorne. There, Nimia grew up, and, well, she kind of didn't like her life there. So, she disguised herself as a um, peasant. Well, actually, I'm skipping ahead. So, on her 13th birthday, um, shortly after the black blood infection claimed her mother's life, I'm reading from the book now, the princess ran away, disguising herself as a commoner and changing her name to Titania. Then she passes basically from temple to temple, going from Mima to Mima throughout their society. The Mimas, as we discussed in our previous episode, are kind of the mothers of the temple. They're the high priestesses of the Fae. And there, she gathered all of the stories of her people and all the variations in the stories of her people. And through this work and through this project, she produced a book called The Garden Cantos that contains all of this lore, all of these stories that she had gathered, as well as her own insights about how the stories interconnected and how rich and diverse Farish belief was. And instead of trying to wrap it all up into one big volume and say, look, here we are, this is who we are, and starting a new faith, as it were, Titania basically enshrined the core beliefs of the Fae into giving in to the ways of nature and that the natural world is to be admired and to be a part of and to be lived in balance with. And so she united her people spiritually, but not in a common religion per se, and not in a political manner. But she kind of becomes the touchstone for all of the Fae people, for all the fairies. She provided the core of their lives that gives them meaning, their belief, puts their beliefs and their stories and their folklore all in context so that they share this rich heritage together. She, in many ways, is the thread that holds the Fae together. And we can see this in the way the Fae relate to each other throughout Season 1. Now, one of my great hopes is that they uh, will eventually give us more information about her and some of the other great ones that are mentioned in here. And maybe we'll hear more from the Mimas, because the Mimas are there to keep knowledge. They are healers and spiritual leaders. They are there to make sure that the traditions are practiced. And it's because of St. Titania that the new ways developed. This way of having everything together in one belief, one concept of the fairish folk of Tirnanak. But they do not have this peaceful fairy folk that most people who have never read any of the original Irish or Celtic folk tales might be surprised by. There's this wonderful line in the book I want to share with you that says, quote, Mima are held in high esteem by the fairish folk. They are an invaluable allies and dangerous enemies. A Mima may be as gentle as a lamb or as unyielding as a storm, but they are always a force to be reckoned with. And the few Mima we have actually got to meet on the show really have shown that in great detail. And I don't know, there's so many more questions that I have and so much more I want to see developed. I really like that they found a way with the fairies in this setting to maintain the kind of delicacy that you expect from a fairy in that they have the hollow bones and they're slight of build and all of that. 
but at the same time kept the fierce wildness that a good fae should always have. And I love that about this setting. I love that about the show, and I'm hoping that that continues. We've gotten to see a little bit of fairish magic in the first season. And there's part of me that kind of hopes that we get to see more of that. Or maybe more from the fawns. Because I'm really curious about them. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm not really comfortable doing this. If you if you can't tell, this is the first time I've really done this kind of world breakdown. So let me know what you thought. You can find my voicemail um, system, the link to it, down in the show notes. Keep it short, keep it clean so I can use it on the show. I would love to hear from you, especially if you have any suggestions on how I can do these a little bit better in future. If you'd rather hit me up on social media, you can find me as C.E. Dorset on both Twitter and Instagram. Alrighty, if you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate the podcast. It does help out a lot. If you've got a dollar, you can pass my way. In the show notes, you'll find a link to both my Patreon and the Community Support tab. The difference between the two is people on Patreon occasionally get stuff. And thank you to everybody who does that. It really does mean a lot to me. If you don't have any money right now, or you don't feel like giving, that's fine. But if you know somebody that you think might like this podcast, do share it with them. That helps out a lot. I want to thank you for your kindness. You guys are really been wonderful and i can't wait to see where we go in the future there are a lot of other topics that i'm going to be talking about in carnival row if there's another series you would like me to do this for let me know i I would love to do that and get better about this sort of thing until next time don't forget to have the fun bye